Welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick, a 30-minute walk through the Scriptures, teaching in-depth Bible truths that change people's lives. Now, here's your host, Les Feldick. Okay, good to have everybody in this afternoon, and uh, especially from those of you who have driven a distance, you're from out of state, and uh, we appreciate your, uh, your faithfulness. All right, we're going to, for the sake of our television audience, we're just going to pick right up where we left off in our last half-hour program. So for those of you that get this on a weekend, I, it'll be a week lapse, but sooner or later down the road, it'll be a daily, and then all you have to do is wait 24 hours. But we're going to pick right up where we left off at the end, and that was in Psalms chapter 2, and we're looking at the Messianic Psalms. There are 16 of them that uh, deal particularly with the coming of a promised king and Messiah. And they are so plainly put that there's just no room for argument that these prophets were speaking of that which now, of course, we understand is just right out in front of us as the world events are taking place. All right, so we're going to come back to Psalms chapter 2. And uh, we have just covered in our last half hour the fact that Jesus Christ was the only begotten Son of God by virtue of his resurrection. And uh, that alone sets him apart from everything else. And now we're going into the next aspect of the psalm where God says in verse 8, Ask of me, and I will give thee the heathen, or the non-Jewish world, for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth, for thy inheritance, for thy possession. Now that doesn't just mean the little nation of Israel, that means the whole planet is going to come under the rulership of this kingdom. All right, but before that can happen, he has to defeat his enemies, and we see that in verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. All right, now then let's just jump up to some of the other prophets and see how they picture that. And uh, we're going to look at Daniel first, because Daniel, of course, is the very benchmark of most end time prophecy. And uh, you remember that Daniel was in captivity in Babylon at the time of Nebuchadnezzar. And they, the king had had a dream, and he couldn't remember what it was. And you remember that Daniel was brought up from wherever he was, and he not only rehearsed the dream, but he interpreted it. And it was a prophetic thing. It was a prophecy concerning the coming Gentile empires, beginning with Babylon and going all the way up to the Roman, which, of course, took us up to the time of Christ. All right, so I just want you to see a little bit of this to show that before the king and the kingdom can become a reality, he would have to destroy all the empires that were still on the scene at the time of his coming, which, of course, would be the four major empires that Daniel foretold in the first place. All right, now you want to remember that he saw a vision of a human being, humongous in size, frightening in its appearance, and it had a head of gold, had a chest of silver, had belly and legs of brass, the two legs then of iron, and then the feet and the toes iron mixed with clay, which were indicative of the Babylonian, the Mede and the Persian, the Greek, and the Roman, and then the one, as we now see coming up, a revived Roman Empire. All right, but the place I want to take you here in Daniel chapter 2 is up to verse 35. Now, there is no indication here of 2,000 years interval. There is no indication that these empires are now in possession of nuclear weapons and modern warfare and so forth. And yet, we have to realize that's all part of the reality of it now. But when the tribulation will run its course, the end result will be, verse 35 again of Daniel 2, and so then was the iron, the clay, now we're starting from the feet, remember, because that's where the steamroller is going to hit it first, and it's in the form of a stone cut out without hands in the symbolism, but in the reality, it's the second coming of Christ, see? All right, so the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, the gold were broken to pieces. See what the psalmist said? They would be smashed. All right, all these symbolic pieces of the kingdom were smashed together, became like the chaff of the summer threshing floor, and the wind carried them away. 
that no place was found for them. All right, now get the picture. What is being driven into nothingness? All the Gentile empires. Now, just look at the world today. Everything is global. You all realize that. All the banking systems are global. Manufacturing is global. Uh, communications is global. Everything is coming into a global uh, connection. All right, now when Christ comes in, he won't just destroy one segment of it in the Middle East. It will be a global destruction from pole to pole and from east to west. And it will totally be swept away so that there is no sign of any of these pagan, ungodly, satanic empires will be left. And then finish the verse, and the stone that smote the image, that's Jesus the Christ, will smote the image, will become a great mountain or kingdom. And what does that kingdom fill? The whole earth. So it's going to be a complete earth kingdom involving every nation and tribe and tongue. All right, I'd like to have you look at one more that we've used over the years quite often because of the simplicity of it. And that's go up to Zechariah, the next to the last book in your Old Testament, and jump up to chapter 14. Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 9. And like I said, it's the simplicity of this verse. That's why I use it. Zechariah, chapter 14, verse 9. Zechariah 14, verse 9. Y'all got it? And the Lord. Now that word, Lord, capitalized in the Old Testament is Jehovah. It's God the Son, as we understand him in the New Testament. And he shall be king of over how much of the earth? All of it. Every square mile is going to be under his power and under his jurisdiction. And there shall be one Lord. He is going to be absolute. He will not have a bunch of subservience laboring under him, except, of course, the 12 are going to rule the 12 tribes of Israel. But he is going to be king of kings and lord of lords. One Lord and his name is shall be called one. And of course, we can pick that up in Revelation, but you know the verse as well as I do, so we'll just spare the time that his name shall be King of Kings and Lord of Lords. All right, now then let's go back to Psalms chapter 2 and finish the chapter so we can go on into the next one. Verse 10. So now the prophet writes, Be wise now therefore, O you kings, not just Israel's, not just the Gentiles, but all of them. Be instructed, you judges or rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Rejoice with trembling. But will they do it? No way. There's no fear of God in their eyes. They have no recognition that he is sovereign above them all. But nevertheless, the instruction is here. Now look at verse 12. Kiss the Son. In other words, a sign of endearment. Recognize who he is, lest he be angry and you perish from the way. When his wrath... Now you've got to remember that we've been living 2,000 years under the grace of God. His wrath hasn't been exposed one iota. But oh, when it will be. It's going to be beyond human comprehension. And so the warning is again, when his wrath is kindled but a little, but for the believers, whether it be Jew or Gentile, they're blessed if they'll put their trust in him because he alone is the Savior of the world. All right, now let's just jump forward to chapter 8, which is the second in our series of Psalms that are messianic in character. Psalms chapter 8. And we'll just start at verse 1 again. Psalms chapter 8, verse 1. I'll give you time to all find it. O Lord, our Lord. Now, what do you see there? Well, you see two forms of Lord. Do you realize that? 
One is all capitalized, and the other one is just capital L, small o-r-d. Now, just to show you that that's not a quirk of Scripture, jump ahead, keep your hand in this one, jump ahead to Psalms 110, verse 1, and we see the same thing. It's almost a phenomenon. Just one of the few times in Scripture that we have this, and I have to explain it. Psalms 110, verse 1. We may be even looking at it later on this afternoon. The Lord, all capitalized, say it unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Now, you see, I have to explain this because I just got through telling you that the capitalized L-O-R-D is Jehovah. It's God the Son. It's Jesus Christ. But in these two instances, that cannot be the case because it isn't God the Son speaking to God the Son. It's whom speaking or who is speaking to the Son? Well, God the Father. So we just have to kind of ride with that without trying to get real nitpicky that in both these cases, because especially Psalms 110 makes it so obvious. Just look at it. Where the Lord said, God the Father said unto my Lord, God the Son, sit thou at my right hand. Isn't that exactly what happened? God the Father didn't sit at the Son's right hand. So we just have to take all these things into consideration. Now the same way back here with Psalms chapter 8. Come back with me again. Here we have those same two spellings of Lord, and it's for the same reason. Our Lord, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who has set thy glory above the heavens. Well, now we're dealing with both personalities of the Godhead here again, with God the Father, certainly putting God the Son in that place of glory and authority above all the heavens. All right, now then drop into verse 2. Out of the mouths of babes and sucklings, or nurserings, Hast thou ordained strength because of thy enemies that thou mightest still or defeat the enemy and the avenger? All right, let's jump all the way up to Matthew 21 for a minute and see how the Lord Jesus himself puts his stamp of approval on that very verse. Matthew 21, verse 16. Matthew 21, verse 16. And remember now, this is during the Lord's earthly ministry. And so a good portion of this is in red, if you have a red letter edition. And here we have in verse 16, where Jesus said, Yea, have you never read out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast perfected praise? What's he quoting? The Psalms that we just read, word for word. See how it all ties together? And that puts the stamp of approval on the Psalms as the Word of God because Jesus himself used it as such. All right, so back to Psalms chapter 8 again. So verse 2, repeating it. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings thou hast ordained strength because of thine enemies that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. Now verse 3. When I consider the heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon, the stars, which thou hast ordained. Now i got to stop again. Let's jump all the way up to Colossians. Chapter 1, verses that we've used over and over again to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt. Who was the creator of the universe and everything in it? Well, God the Son. God the Son, Jesus of Nazareth. Oh, people don't like to think of the earthly Jesus as the creator of Genesis 1, but beloved, he was. And here we have it in Colossians chapter 1, and I usually like to drop down to verse 13 so that we identify who is this creator. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13. 
who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and hath translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, who, verse 15 now, the Son is the image or that visible likeness. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn. He's ahead of everything else that was ever created. He was the firstborn of every creature. Now here it comes. For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible, invisible. Whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things, everything was created by him and for him. And in verse 17, and he is before all things. He came out of eternity past. And consequently, there was nothing created before God himself was there. And so God the Son is before all things, and by him all things are held together or consist. And then I got to go on to verse 18, because here's his role so far as you and I are concerned. Not only is he a creator of us and everything around us, but he is the head of the body of which we are a part. And that's how we are intricately connected with this creator, God the Son. And we're going to be in his presence for all eternity. My, we can wait for the time when we'll be able to look into his eyes. And we're going to see him as he is, the scripture says. All right, now then, back to the Psalms again. How all this becomes a living reality and how this book is so miraculous, see? All right, back to Psalms chapter 8. Then verse 4. After considering the heavens, space. Oh, my goodness. You know, I, I think we're all hearing it from every direction. The magnitude of space, how it's beyond human comprehension. My, I was just reading an article again last night that our scientists have picked up light beams from 16 billion light years away. <laughs> now, see, that's beyond human comprehension. A light year is the distance that light can flattle at the rate of 186,000 miles per second for 365 days. See, we can't comprehend what one light year is. And now they're talking about billions of them. That's our God. See, he's the creator of it all. All right, now in light of that, I like verse 4. What is man? The simple manifestation of the dust of the earth that we are. What is man that thou, O oh God, I could put in there, that, you're, that you, God, are mindful of him? And then in the other half of the thought that the Son of Man, who God again brought into a particular relationship with you and I, this is all beyond our comprehension. Lest I think I got a verse in Hebrews I want to look at. Hebrews 2, 6 to 8. Let's look at that a minute. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 6, 7, and 8, where again the writer makes it better and plainer than I could ever hope to do it. Hebrews chapter 6. Six, seven, and 8. Hebrews chapter 6. No, 2. I'm sorry, I didn't look right. Chapter 2. Hebrews 2, 6, 7, and 8. All got it? Hebrews 2, starting verse 6. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man, that thou art mindful of him, or the son of man, that thou visitest him? In other words, why did God have enough concern for mankind to do the work of redemption which required God the Son to take on human flesh and cohabit planet Earth with him in order to become the sacrifice for all concern. All right, so this is the question. Why? What is man that thou art mindful of him? 
or the Son of Man, a reference to the Christ, that thou visitest him. Thou madest him, now I'm sure we're speaking of the Christ here, God the Son, thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Now that's hard to comprehend, isn't it? But he was, became he, because he became humanity. He took on human flesh, and as such, he took himself below the realm of the angelic host. All right? And it doesn't stop there. Even though he was little lower than the angels, you crowned him with glory and honor and did set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection under his feet, for in that he put all in subjection under him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we not see him yet, all things put under him. But we see Jesus, verse 9. Now do you get the, the connection? Here is little insignificant man on insignificant planet earth in view of the whole of creation. Absolutely nothing compared to creation. And yet, what did God see? He saw the value of the human race. That's why he created it. And I think I've explained it from the time I first started teaching Genesis, years and years ago. Why did he create the human race? He had the eons of angels. Why the human race when it became such a failure? Well, you see, the angelic host did not have that wherewithal to return his love. And now again, we can't understand that, but they couldn't. But you see, he created man with that ability within us to return the love of deity. Animals can't do that. And so we alone, in all of God's creation, can be an object of his extended love that would respond. And he put the same thing into the marriage relationship. I always like to put the two together. What did God put within the female makeup? That ability and therewith to respond to the love of the husband. And it's something that's beyond human understanding. When a husband and wife relationship is working as it should be, it's beyond understanding. And so this is what we have to put all the things together. God had such a love for this insignificant creature that he made from the dust of the earth that he was willing to actually leave the glories of heaven, walk the dusty paths of the land of Israel, and go to that Roman cross, and as Philippians puts it so beautifully, even the death of the cross. For what purpose? To redeem at least enough mankind that he can have to extend his love for all eternity. Now, most of that is beyond our human comprehension. And that's why I think the psalmist puts it this way. Come back with me again, if you will, to Psalms chapter 8. And so who is man that God should even be mindful of him? And who is the son of man who would go to such lengths to redeem mankind? And in verse 5, as we just read in the book of Hebrews, this is where the writer got it. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Now then, verse 6, in he, uh, Psalms chapter 8, Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet. Now, you know, I'm thinking of another individual who was given dominion of everything. Who was it? Adam. Adam was give, given dominion of everything from one end of the planet to the other. But Adam dropped the ball, see? And so the whole 6,000 years of human history, with all of its misery and turmoil and death, is a result of Adam's failure. But the second Adam as the New Testament calls Jesus Christ. He's going to make the whole thing right once again, and now he will absolutely have everything under his dominion. Let me take us back to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 15.
1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're also going to look at Philippians chapter 2. Because I just want you to see how all of Scripture is constantly dovetailing. There isn't a book on earth that can even come close, and yet mankind scorns it and ridicules it. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 27. All got it? For he, there again, I think that's a reference to God the Father. He hath put all things under his, Christ, God the Son, he hath put all things under his feet. But when he saith all things are put unto him, it is manifest that he is accepted, which did put all things under him. All right, now then if you'll flip over to Philippians chapter 2. Again, we have it in simplistic language. Philippians chapter 2. If we got time, I'd like to jump all the way up to verse 7. Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. But speaking of Christ Jesus, made himself of no reputation, took upon himself the form of a servant or a bond slave, was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man. See that? His, his becoming human. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself from that exalted position in glory and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That's the one I referred to a moment ago. Wherefore? Because he was obedient to that horrible crucifixion. God again, the Father, has also highly exalted him and given him a name that is above every name. And then they try to bring him down to the level of some of the religious gods of this world. Isn't it pitiful? But that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven things in earth and things under the earth, even into the nether world, and then verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. <laughs> Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick. Through the Bible is a partner-supported ministry. If this program has been a help to your study of the scriptures and you'd like to see others enjoy the teaching, your support would be greatly appreciated. Write to us at Les Feldick Ministries, 30706 West Lona Valley Road, Kenta, Oklahoma, 74552, or call one 800 369-7856. Remember, all programs are available in printed form, audio cassette, and videotape. Be sure to tune in next time to Through the Bible with Les Felding.